Well, hey everyone, today I interview Tampi Bernard from Talking Matters and uh, we uh, specifically cover the importance of language in our home and we answer the question, does the way we talk to our young children matter? Let's get into it. So welcome to the podcast, Tampi, it's great to meet you. And you, Mike, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Um, so you work for this very cool organisation that I've um, had the pleasure of meeting over the last, uh, I guess, six months um, called Talking Matters. Tell us a little bit about Talking Matters. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. Talking Matters is a uh, non-for-profit organisation and uh, actually we've just um, become our own entity, actually. We've been under the umbrella, yeah. uh, umbrella of Comet. Um, Auckland, New Zealand, and they have a lot of different okay. project streams that go through there. Uh, Talking Matters is um, an awesome co papa and it's basically about the power of talk in the first 1,000 days and how talking grows brains. So, you know, the first right. 1,000 days is a golden opportunity to really invest in your child um, for better learning, for growing the, uh, the brain synapses, all the connections that happen with a young child at birth and even in utero. So talking right. um, to your children is just does some remarkable things for their brains and um, just building them in general. Uh, the capacity of, you know, the people they're going to become later, uh, that leads on to yeah. literacy, all sorts of things. So, right. yeah, we, um, <clears throat> I come through that co-papa as a parent, took a year off my yeah. teenage job, uh, come through that avenue in my local community here. Um, in Mount Wellington, but Tamaki region, um, out here, Panula, Glen Innes. Uh, Glen Innes is where the Glen Innes Family Centre is based, and they took on the right. program of Talking Matters for us. Uh, so I've come through there as a parent with my son, Hawaii, who was almost one, on that co-papa of Talking Matters, right. and um, I just, you know, being a parent, I've already got uh, three kids prior, so yeah, yeah. I've, I, I just thought, what else could you teach me about parenting really with talk because I've already got older kids right now but um, it really is amazing the things that happen yeah. in the first 1,000 days uh, with the brain is so so important so I fell in love with the co-papa um, had my son go through the the program yeah and I was just I was just blown away I, I just looked at everything like I was on a 1,000 day challenge to sort of wow. up my game get things right talking to your children not just talking but really connecting and being present yeah and it's really important yeah. because um you know dads play a big part but we're often the old school where we want to work and try and make wifey less stressful for wifey but actually um you know i took a year off work to and when we had hawaii and man it, it was just the hardest job <laughs> changing those yeah. nappies being up in the middle of the wow. morning trying to let mum sleep and all that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, it, wow. yeah, it's awesome, Mike. That is awesome, man. Because I, you know, uh, there'll be a lot of dads out there like that were like me, where you're kind of like, well, I'll, I'll engage once the kid gets interesting. You know, like once they can walk or talk to me a, a bit more, or um, you know, just to you know go fishing with them or something. Then I'll, I'll start <laughs> engaging. But, um, <laughs> What you're yeah. saying, actually, that um, language is really important in those first 1,000 days. So that's about those th first three years. So what did you learn as a dad before you joined Talking Matters? What were some of the big challenges for you about, um, you know, that, that talking, matter, talking Matters challenge you on? Well, you know, I being a father, I think, um, like I was just saying before, you know, being just so old school, just getting into the mahi and going out there, you know, I've done all sorts of different lines of work, you know, a lot of it has been in trucks and transport and logistics and, um, you know, mm. doing, doing a lot of laborious work. So when you get home, you were pretty knackered from, from a day and, um, you know, you sort of need a yeah. bit of time sometimes before you get in the door to wind down a bit before you actually feel like you're present with your kids. And of course the kids want to jump all over you and, and ask how your day is and, and that's fine, but you're really not giving yourself, um, the real. So I'm just turning my timer no, on. No, that's okay. On. So I, uh, I uh, forgot to, forgot to uh, time myself because I've been doing these a little bit long. So this will keep me on track. Carry on, mate. Yeah, uh, no, so, yeah, no. So um, you're right in the middle of something there. Yeah. You know, you think about parenting. You know, I'm 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 of Samoan descent myself, 
uh, born here in Aotearoa. Uh, my wife is um, is Maori predominantly, um, right. amongst other things. But um, sort of your culture and identity is one thing as well. Yeah. Um, that comes through. I, you know, always knew who where I was from and who I am. But the importance of that, you sort of get assimilated, you know, being a New Zealand as a, mm. as, as a migrant family coming from Samoa back in the early days in the 70s. You sort of, um, the default mm. becomes the English and society. And, and it, the reason why my parents immigrated here was to give us a better future in education, um, you know, just to really set us up. And so they gave up everything, which, which is a massive um, sacrifice yep. for them, everyone they loved, everyone they were close to. English is second language. So yeah. Um, oh. when I think about that in parenting, I I always knew who I was and where I was from, but I didn't really celebrate that too much. Uh, just sort of, you know, just falling into the mainstream of school and stuff. Right. But yep. through the co-pop of Talking Matters, um, you know, really standing yep. strong in who you are, to know where you've come from, is to know where you're going, you know, that old saying is. So it's a real... Right. It really made me um, dive deeper. I mean, we've got my wife, you know, you got your pet beha, your fucker papa, all that sort of stuff, which is, I've learned now, is just so important to keep you connected and, um, you know, your, your, your lineage of where you're from. When you know all that stuff, it actually strengthens you and helps you. It just makes you a stronger and a better person. You, you seem more prepared for the world around you and you just connect more. So that's important um, for um, dad to connect with their lineage a bit more, um, to know their pepeha, you know, their story, where they come from. Um, there'll be some people oh, yes, that sorry. are listening to this that aren't in New Zealand and they don't know what a pepeha <laughs> is, but it's that, you know, it's what, what you sort of fuck up back to, you know, your, your mountain and your river. And, and yeah, exactly. It's, so it's a, a short way of telling I mean, you you can tell me exactly <laughs> if I describe this right, but it's just sort of telling your story. That's you know, right. this is where I'm from. This is my, my land, and um, this is uh, where I connect back to. Um, and are you t- talking there about teaching that to your children? Is that this this connection back to talking matters? Yeah. So talking matters has taught me to um, really um, really embrace your your culture. I mean, I I do speak Samoan, but with my three kids prior, I didn't really, I always knew that, oh, you know, you got to learn to speak your language to, you know, it gives you more connections in social circles, actually. You actually, mm. you know, you're in more places if you can speak another language because you're connecting with more people. It's just the yeah. basics. And um, my three elder children understand certain things and can hear certain things but can't say certain things back. Um, so with Hawaii, um who's now four, one when he jumped on the program in the community. And it just taught me to be more intentional about speaking the language to him. Because in the first right. 1,000 days, your brain, children's brains are just remarkable. I mean, they, they double in size, yeah. you know, the age of one in 12 months, their brain yeah. has doubled in size. I mean, you know, in the first 1,000 days, 80% of the brain is, is formulated. So there's just a massive amount of um, growing and brain connections that are happening. So that's the most crucial time to invest in everything you invest in saying and teaching and the positive experiences and the relationships you form with your children. Um, It it just sets them up for life, basically, and it gives them a head start. So say that again. I think I read on your website somewhere. You just talked about the 80%. What is that? What is that? statistic you're talking about the brain growth that happens in the first year was that what you were talking yeah, about yeah so sorry to slow that down um the first 12 months by the by the time your right. child turns one on their first birthday yeah their brain size has doubled the brain the brain growing. growing or yeah. wh- wow yeah that's incredible yeah, yeah it's remarkable it's, doubled. It's, re- okay. it's really remarkable and, and that's one thing is the neuroscience that as a parent, you know, I didn't really hear things about the first 1,000 days with any of my kids previous. Um, no. And it, it's far, it's worrying and firing. So the brain, a child is born um, capable to speak any language in the world, um, but it will speak yeah. the language that they most commonly hear around them. And it's a remarkable thing. I mean, inside the puku, inside utero, if you start talking, singing, 
sharing things with your child, even their name, if you have their name before before they actually arrive, they identify with that. And when a child's born, wow. they can pick out their mum in a crowded room, their dad, the voice of their siblings. It's just yep. amazing what they can do. Amazing. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Name. So you're talking about even teaching a second language or having two languages going on, even in those first thousand days, talking both is not confusing to a child? Yeah, absolutely right. It's, um, well, in my case, we're speaking three. So we're speaking Samoan, Te Reo, and, and, and English. Um, and Hawaii's sort of proof of that. You know, he's four now. And, you know, people people tend to say, oh, that, actually, that's going to confuse the child. I hear that a lot in my line of work. Mm-hmm. It's going to confuse the child. It's going to yeah, delay yeah. speech. It's going to yeah. delay them speaking. And in some cases, you will find that maybe they do. Some of them are late speakers, but they're still within the, the, the threshold of, of the growth of, the, you know, where they should be with their yeah. ages and yeah. stages. But, um, you know, it's just amazing when... I can speak to my child, and he chooses which language to um, answer me back in. Wow. Is it that, um, like, are you saying that speaking two languages isn't necessarily going to delay them? Children can be delayed in their language regardless for whatever reasons, but speaking a second language isn't going to cause them to be confused or delayed. Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. And that's the... That's the power of the first 1,000 days. I mean, um, yeah, children are, are learning to connect meaning with words. You know, every, everything, mm. there's a meaning. So they, the more you talk to them about things and the more you sort of sort of talk through stuff with, with, with children, I mean, actually talk to them like they I talk to my son like he's, I don't use all the baby words and all the, we never have. We sort of. Yeah. 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 So that's my phone. No, that's okay. But the intonation of your voice is another thing. That rhythmic intonation of your voice, um, you know, we can we can still talk in the same way. It's not really baby talk, but we're filling in the gaps and we're just making them realize that um, the things they see. We also like to use juicy words is what we call them, but extending language and, you know, instead of just saying, son, can you grab me that dinosaur? That's a dinosaur there. Um, we would just pick up the dinosaur and say, hey, look, can you pass me the Tyrannosaurus Rex? He's the strongest. He's, he's the king of the dinosaurs with the big legs and the small front legs. Yes. All that sort of yes. stuff. He could rattle off um, a brontosaurus, yes. a stegosaurus, a, you know, all that sort of stuff. We, because kids don't, in those early years, they don't really have um, an idea of what's hard, harder or hardest. They just know that they are being, um, they're in conversation and they're talking and they're learning what, what's around them. Um, okay. And they just pick it up. So, yeah, you're talking there um, baby talk, which we kind of naturally do. Is that bad? Like, I mean, you're talking about baby talk. I don't know whether you are sort of putting them versus each other, baby talk versus, you know, explaining the, the dinosaur's name and everything. But is um, should we be of trying to avoid baby talk and just sort of being more mature in our language or, or, or not? Well, yeah, that, well, they used to call that parentese, but... Um, it, it isn't a bad thing. I mean, people do it all the time. I used to do it all the time. You know, you, you're thinking you're speaking the language of the baby, which you kind of are, because like I was just saying, the intonation of your voice is sort of what yeah. gets to them. So, you know, when babies are born, they're reading your face. It's very important. They read your facial expressions. They can actually mimic your emotions when you watch a child, even though they can't speak it or vocalize at the time about words with words in it, but they actually read your face. So when you, um, it just, when, when you think about, um, I always think about the challenge of, I'm on a 1,000 day challenge, so that's what I was with Hawaii yeah. who's four now, and I still carried on, but um, I'm just trying to, um, what we're doing in the house is, he's been the catalyst to change in the house, we talk to him more intentionally, we want to grow his yep. vocabulary, um, we want him to think bigger than just a a, a normal word and it, it's really evident to see he can he can play with an excavator and someone else yeah. will call it a digger but he knows yeah. it's it's both but he would rather choose the word excavator yeah. over a digger awesome. at his young age yeah for example. so in your thousand your personal you know you've obviously gone hey thousand days of you know massive formation time and a child and you've um taken this personal challenge you know, to 
I've got a thousand days, you know, counting down 999, you know, or whatever it is. What are some of the big things that you've focused on that you think um, is transferable to other dads? Yeah, I think I, I think the main thing is be present. You know, just right. just just be present. Yeah. Um, if you're not present, you, wow. you're not really there. So how how are you connecting? How are you even um, engaging with your child? Really, you can't. It's such a challenge, eh? Like it shouldn't be, but mm. it is. Uh, I know in the, with our phones, probably. Yeah. Um, you know, as you talked about coming home, hard day's work, you're physically tired, but stressed from the day. Um, and I, I guess for mums potentially too, they could be breastfeeding whilst they're looking on the phone rather than talking to baby. You know, there's all those kind definitely of challenges, is, right? Definitely is, definitely is. Well. And unfortunately, um, that is happening, um, you know, for technology nowadays. Uh, that's it. Mm. You know, you, you actually do fine parents, mums looking at a phone when breastfeeding is the perfect time to really communicate and talk with your child. So there's, there's a serve and return, if you haven't heard of that phrase, it's a serve and return is um, just back and forth talking, interaction. Mm. So it's, when you think about serve and return, the term of that, um, you know, it's, ba it's grounded in the science of Harvard University over there in the States, you know, they've been doing a lot of studies mm -hmm. on stuff. But serve and return is a term that you'll hear, and it reminds you of a tennis match, one serves, one returns. So you sort of get this rally going. So we want a language rally with your child. And with young babies, you know, even though they can't talk, the expression of their eyes and their coos and, and the way that they move their hands or they, they lean towards you or they just frown, mm -hmm. all that is communication and conversation. Um, and, a lot, and, and we don't really think about that because we don't hear words coming out of their mouth in those younger days, in those, those infant days. So yep. we've got to switch yep. that. Oh, that's interesting, man. So I saw that on your website and I was going to um, ask about that, serve and return. And I think what I'm hearing you saying is uh, for mama, when she's feeding baby, you know, um, and, um, you know, she just might be seeing what's going on with the baby and just, just talking, you know, just... Um, Seeing, seeing baby's movements as a serve and mum's response as a, a re, the return, you know, and, and talking rather than being on the phone and disconnecting or, or not taking that opportunity to um, to have a, a language-rich environment around that child. Exactly. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought it. The, the language-rich environment is, uh, is also something big in my work because, you know, the environments, I mean, your environment shapes your child, right? We we, we are shaped by our environment, is, is is the saying. So, and and that's perfectly true in my opinion. I mean, if you get a child that grows up in a toxic environment where there's you know screaming or there's domestic violence or there's bad language or there's just mm. just bad practice, I mean, we have to model to our kids at a young age of how to be. Um, yeah, and we have to, you know, to see a young child stressed or or not, not be vocal, not talk. Often you find children that are quiet have come from a really bad environment, unfortunately. And there's a lot of lot of reasons for that. And I think poverty and, you know, just the challenges of life can be pretty hard, especially here in New Zealand. COVID happening, it's, it's just got worse. But, um, yeah. yeah, you know, the environment shapes you. So if you're in a, an environment where you're making space to, Get your ducks in a row. Hey, we won't, we won't, we'll never argue in front of the child. Let's talk more. Let's read. Let's get out for mm. walks. Um, you know, let's get the kids to, to play a game. Let's get involved. All that sort of stuff. Those positive experiences with your child is the best thing that you can do. So that's a powerful statement. Our cult, our um, environment shapes us. Um, and so the feel, the feel of the room, the, the the environment that we're creating, which is created by, I guess, in a large part by our language, and by the tone of our voice, um, the words that we use, that they're all shaping the environment that our kids are um, being brought up in. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, 
serving and returning is a mechanism that dads can use to engage with their children. How how should a dad be returning or serving? You know, how how should a, what can a dad be doing, thinking about when he gets home? Hey, hey anything you know, you know, serve doesn't have to be with words. You know, serve could be uh, my son jumping on my back, and, and he served to me that hey, dad, I want to play. So in return, I'll probably get up and start tickling him on the bed. Mm. Um, you know, he'd, he'd probably just give me a few punches and run off. And so yeah. now we're engaged in a bit of a conversation that's more about the actions and, and there's yep. a lot of laughter. So it could be something like, um, you know, you could be sitting there with your child and you, you could just ask him if he's hungry. And if he turns around and says, you know, oh, no, I'm all right. And then... Instead of just leaving it at there, it's like, oh, well, what, what have you eaten today? Mm. Tell me about that. What was your favorite food? So you're just sort of keeping the rally going as much as you yeah. can. And actually, yeah. you, you want to keep it sort of open-ended. Yeah. You, uh, when you ask questions that are just short, and there'll be days when I say to her, Waikiki, how was your day? Good. Mm. And that's it. It doesn't go anywhere from there. But, you know, things like this hair's messed up. Say, hey, man, your hair's all messed up. We've been play, have you been playing out in the outside in the in the wind today? And he's like, Yeah. Played on the trampoline today. I said, Oh, did you do your forward flip? He goes, Yeah, I did. So it starts to yeah. you know, it's really cool when you can actually tune in, follow their lead, you know, know exactly what how they feel. Yeah. Um that that, that also extends to book reading. Mm. It's important to read to your child because the amount of words that they hear um around them really you know, starts starts growing their brains and the way words words work and what they mean and how they feel. Yeah. Um, so often with young children, and in my experience too, I'm trying to read a book aloud, and they just sit there and want to keep pulling to the next page or even to the end. You know, and often you'll find parents start trying to pull it back and say, no, 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 and you're trying to read the word. But that child is actually serving to you to say, hey, look, I want to get to something else that I've seen in the book, and it might be a a sun or a rainbow and you know, right. pointing to that and they land on it. So in return, that's a serve to say, hey, Dad, this is what I'm serving to you. And I'll be like, oh, the sun, look how bright that is. Then we start investigating that. Then, mm. then I'll even put him in the story. You don't have to worry about the words on the page is the other thing. Um, you just go with it. Yeah. However, it's going to keep that serve and return going. Those responsive interactions is what it is. Oh. Best thing. So... Um, I found when I was a young dad, book reading was a, a thing that I could engage with more easily. You know, there was with babies, you know, you can't breastfeed and, um, you get home and they might, might not be like, I don't know. It's just sort of how you're trying to work out how to engage with this <laughs> child, you know, and, and, um, yeah, yeah. and, um, book reading was a, a way that I've found that I couldn't connect with my kid before bedtime. Um, how important is that? Um, do you th and for dads, like, do you think that's um, something you'd be encouraging dads to to do? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, book reading is if, if you make time, like you said, you used to do that at, at bedtime. You were saying um, it, it, for for children, they 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 kind of anticipate and they all look, look forward to that. There's a mm -hmm. kind of a routine that happens, and they know that dad is going to be the one who reads to me. The, yeah. And that's the thing they look forward to. And if it's just 10 or 15 minutes a day, um, mm. that is just going to be phenomenal for you guys with a relationship. But it's yeah. also, um, it's not just connecting you emotionally and, um, you know, the father-dad-son relationship that's happening, but you're also teaching them a lot about empathy, um, about love, about spending mm. time. And you're also talking about a story that's actually growing their brain and their capacity to learn about the way that story has worked. Yep. There are characters in there. Can you see yourself in that character? How did you feel about that story? All that sort of stuff is that connection that you guys are formulating. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, they look forward to that time mm -hmm. when they know that dad's going to read to you. Yeah. 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 I'm the same with the white. He gets ready for it. Yeah. yeah. He chooses books and yeah. we're all ready to go. Are you, um, just a little sort of a, a segue, I, I, do you, are you quite particular about the type of book you read? Are you intentional about... Is it something that you're trying to, for them to learn or is it just, you know, 
let the child pick a book that's off, <laughs> you know, that doesn't that they have access to or whatever it is. Yeah, but, to be honest, um, following their lead, we, we have like, um, to, we have talking tips that I work with for children and they're, they're just great. It can just be as easy as relax and have fun. Mm. Um, get down to their level is very important because when you get down to their level and you're in their space, doesn't mean you get on the floor all the time. Yeah. You could be at the table, but be in their face, get down to their level, mm. stay connected. Um, so reading with Hawaii, his love of dinosaurs mm. was the first thing that stood out. Right. He loves sharks. That baby shark song came out when, when he started to love sharks before yeah. they came. Yep. So that was just, but so we get shark books, we get animal books, then it changed the dinosaurs. Um, we got into cars and excavators and all that sort of thing. So I would tune into books about that sort of thing. I was yep. also, we were also very mindful of him learning the language. So we, we read bilingual books, yep. um, you know, Samoan, English, Māori. Um, we read those books to him and he, he just loves the different stories, the different, you know, you've got your English stories, you've got your Samoan, you've got your Maori stories, you've got all these different, you've got a collection of some amazing things happening and it just sparks his interest. Um, yep. you don't have to read books. We often lie there in the dark and we just conversate. I tell him stories of when I was his age and he, you know, he loves it. He loves to connect with it. I tell him about where my parents are from, yep. little island of Samoa, you know, we, a lot of ships, a lot of, you know, we navigate the stars. And it's amazing. I mean, my wife was talking to him, you know, we've had Matariki and stuff, talking to him about the stars. He can rattle off all the stars and what what they mean for the environment right. and, and the new year, uh, you know, with the Māori new year and stuff. And, and then... We were talking to him in the lounge. It just happened this week, actually. Talking to uh, to him in the lounge about that because of the stories and the. My wife made him a book, and him and I are the characters in this Matariki book three years ago. Two, three years ago, and um, so he's he's got a connection to the stars, and we we're talking about that and what it means. Um, and then I said to him, "Okay, Hawaii. So, what does the stars mean?" to us, you know, when you think about the stars and what you've been learning and reading about, what does that mean? And he just turned, he was playing with a toy and he just looked up and goes, that the stars are a GPS? And no one ever said to him that the stars are a GPS. Wow. But he's, he's, he's made that connection himself. Yep. He's made that connection because we've got a GPS system in the car, mm. turn on sometimes and I just poke around with that at times. Mm. But it just goes to show that what they see and what they learn, they sponge it. Yeah. And they're starting to make connections to things. So I said to my wife, did you, did you teach him that the stars are a GPS? And she said, no, no. He knows about mapping and stuff wow. with the stars. He's and just, that, that's his way that he, that's how he connects with it. That's how he's connected to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And so we, going back a bit, we were talking, or we were talking about um, being present. Um, for me, I'd be interested to hear your, how you do this. For me, I've, um, I'm, I'm like every other day, I turn up tired. Um, it's so easy just to pull the phone out when I get home. What I've had to do is, and this may not suit everybody for sure. Um, I'm not, I'm just talking about my story, but what, what I've had to do is, uh, in my mind go, Hey, you know, um, I get home about 5 30 at least until 7.30, I'm not going to pull my phone out of my pocket. I'm going to sit down and talk. We're going to play a game or whatever it is, um, get down on the floor and uh, play, talk. Um, and at some point in the evening, I know that I, I do need to zone out as well. I need to make some time for myself um, before I go to sleep. Yeah. Um, so giving myself some grace for that. And the kids also need it. Yep. They also need some downtime. So for me, I found that if, if I'm aiming for a sort of a time of the night where, hey, okay, screens are okay now. You know, we can do screens now. We, we've connected well. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that and how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, look, screen time is here. Um, you know, it, it, it's a part of our, you know, our being now. It's just everywhere. Everyone has a phone, you know, pretty much. And... There's a, 
we don't encourage, to, you know, when, when screen time starts to become the babysitter for our young kids, that, that's when you've mm. got to start worrying about things. That's not good to mm. sit a child in front of the TV for hours at a time, um, playing games, not really socially engaging with the human interaction is, is the biggest thing for our kids because if they don't connect in these early years and they're on these um, watching screen time for long periods of time, we, you know, with all these vibrant colors of these amazing animations and cartoons and characters, what studies are actually finding too is when they get into the classroom, when they transition into school, the live human interaction with teachers just becomes boring. So they end up having a short attention span. They, can, they can't connect to a teacher who doesn't look like the, the bright, sparkly animations that go on. And they, 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 there's a disconnect that's happening already. So I don't, um, you know, we don't dismiss screen time, you know, like yourself and, you know, um, growing up with Hawaii, we're intentional about putting things that were educational on for him to learn about. And as I said about the dinosaurs, we'd have, um, things with dinosaurs and we'd pause things at times in between cooking. I'd go in and I'd pause it and ask him, so what's happening with that? What sort of dinosaur was that? And he would start interacting like that. But when you... When you think about what you sh the content that you want your children to be looking at, or things, either there are apps that are pretty good for just moving things around, learning language, anything that they're interested, zone into those things. It could be as easy as music and nursery rhymes um, that they want to hear, the alphabet going. Um, things like that are great. Um, but when it becomes a babysitter, that's when you're going to worry about. But by all means, all parents need a break. So you just got to... Yeah, yeah. You know, you just got to roll with it and, and the, 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 yeah, it def definitely serves a purpose. Um, and when you sort of gauge the, the time, you might have a time, like you say, that you've finished, you've had your good interactions, all right, you need a bit of a break. So do they. They can go off and do that for a time. Let's cap it at yeah. a time. Then we'll come back and yeah. get ready for dinner together. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, you talk about, you know, reading a book at, Oh, I talked about we talked about reading books to the kids at bed at night, so that's a great way to sort of um, cap cap the night off. Um, so on the Talking Matters website, I mean, so Talking Matters, you don't really work directly with um, Fano family. You, you sort of you provide resources to organisations um, like our organisation, Hapai Fano, and, and help us to provide and encourage um, parents to um, create language-rich environments. Um, just to recap for me, what, why do – you talk about language-rich environments. Why – remind me again, why do these matter? Um, a language-rich environment, especially for our kids, is, um, you know, like I work in the – so I've been coaching out in the um, – out in the community with parents so I, I coach parents mm. with their kids uh, I'm in the okay. I'm in the home so I do home visits right so well, I've done that you know in my community that's awesome so I've come through coaching parents walking alongside yep. parents and and often it's just affirming affirming things that parents do that they don't really think of that they're doing right but then they just turn yep. I should do that a bit more and, and that's all it is encouraging them mm. we're not there to prescribe something really it's just about them tuning into a different way of thinking and a different way of talking, okay. but do it more and do yeah. it often. So just being conscious, you're reminding them of, of being conscious of, of the amount of language that's present. That's right. That's right. right. You know, um, just, you'll find it, it's quite, parents actually can find it quite hard to talk to their children when their children aren't talking right at the, at yeah. the time. So, you know, it's as easy as, you're going to cook something. You're just talking to your baby about, hey, look, I'm going to chuck in this flour. Give that a bit of a, a whirl. What else should we put in there? You're just narrating everything you're doing, basically. Yeah. But they're getting engaged with it. You find that it starts with the looking, the curiosity, and then as they get older, now they're helping. You pour that in. Mm. All that sort of thing. Yeah. So the environment is very important. Um, when I go into the ECE sector, where I've been working as well, working ECEs, um, really child education with Kayako and teachers. So we go in there and um, when children come into an environment like that with a lot of children, they have to feel represented in that space. So they, mm. you know, every child should be seen, heard, how they feel and represented. I mean, 
it's as easy as walking into, if I walk into a classroom, for instance, and I'm greeted with a, oh, it's Alofa, Tampi, you know, that's, I'm from Samoa, they've acknowledged that, and I'm like, hey, it's Alofa, how's, how's your morning? And for kids like that as well, when they see um, their language is shared, when they see that their interests are heard, there could be posters on the wall about things they like, there could be family pictures on the wall that connect them to the family, because it's very important to transition from home to school, the same things that keep them feeling safe and connected to their family when they're in the care of their caregivers or educators or whoever's looking after your baby, your child in those early years for those long periods of time when you're at work and at mahi, it's important to feel that sort of safe connection because kids and babies, are, they learn more from people that they are attuned to and connected to. So that if, in that instance, we're talking about teachers. So um, when a child is represented um, in ways that they feel the language that's being used, um, we encourage, you know, hugs, we encourage, mm. you know, everything that we do is underpinned with love. So if you do everything with love yeah. on top of what you're doing, um, the environment soon becomes a really uh, safe environment for kids. And, and that's what you want. You don't want kids feeling like they don't see themselves in this space. I don't really yeah. relate to this. And so that matters when they're young. I know it's a silly question, but it matters. You're saying that matters even when uh, a baby. Absolutely, absolutely. It all starts there. Um, the experiences, the that, yeah, days. the experiences that your child will have in the first one thousand days will actually set them up for life. Um, so I think what I'm hearing you saying is that we can all relate to feeling the need to feel seen and heard. Right? We as adults, we want to feel seen and heard. That's, and when we're in environments where we feel seen and heard, we feel welcome, we feel safe, we feel secure, we feel welcome. I've said welcome twice. Um, <laughs> and what you're saying is that for babies um, and for toddlers, that that really matters, that the way we talk yep. and even when they're not talking but talking to them and or just responding, body language, whatever it is, to their cues – all of that creates an environment in those first 1,000 days that builds their security, I guess their confidence and their resilience and all of those kind of healthy things that are important for... Absolutely. Yeah, you've hit it on the head. Happiness. Resilience too is a, is a big thing for our kids, you know. They do become more resilient to, 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 right. to the world around them, but they, yeah. they explore so much, so they want to know about and learn about a lot of things. And often... What I find too in my, my mahi with kids is um, when language is a barrier, you know, I see a lot of, um, culturally, I see a lot of kids that are in school that unfortunately there's a short shortage of kayako of teachers there who can't speak te reo or they can't speak Samoan or Tongan or Niue, whatever it is. And so kids are sort of overlooked and, and they're sort of, they don't really communicate well. Um, obviously, the language barrier is acknowledged, but um, I find in my experience, I've gone into some of the centers I'm with, and when I first started, for me to walk in there and speak Samoan to a Samoan child, suddenly I'd get looked at with a stare of blankness, like, oh, and, and, and it's sort of, this guy speaks a language that I speak or I know. So it's kind of like you get looked at and sort of followed around as you're going around and and then you see the group getting bigger and then you see the whispers and the siblings that are in that group will say, hey, there's this guy over here, he speaks. And when we get down, you don't want to be too confronting to the face. You sort of sit there and do something to sort of be in the space and then you wait for a serve from them to sort of stare at you or come and put something next to you and start playing with the car and sort of invite yourself in. And you start speaking yeah. that language. And you'll often find, like I did, conversations started to, when they started to feel trusting and um, hey, this guy speaks like me, he looks like me, and then they start to come out of their shell, and there was just a whole table of communication going on, and the teachers there on the day were just like, wow, what are they saying? I've never seen this. Like, I've never seen them so engaged, and there was all sorts going on. They're telling about the icebox they got down the road in the dairy at the weekend with mum and dad, and otherwise they just sort of haven't been noticed for that sort of, yep. you know, 
emotions and and, and, and and everything, the vocab that they're speaking, the words. So it's a great learning for me in my position, which is very important. I feel privileged to be able to do that because when you get Ministry of Education coming through, you haven't got someone who speaks a language and there's a tick box to tick. Unfortunately, that's how our kids can fall through the cracks unless you, you know, can engage with them. Yeah, it's fascinating. So you're talking about children that are in a school, they, it's not a, there's not the, the teacher doesn't understand, um, isn't able to speak Samoan or whatever the language is and just you stepping in and, um, those kids feeling seen and heard because, you know, there's a, there's a common, you speak the language. And it's commonality. That's right. Commonalities. Right. And, hey, you know, the other thing is I've gone in there and I've actually been a father figure. Yeah. You know, some of these kids don't have dads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's another thing that, you know, I sort of, I feel a real connection to kids too, because now I'm seen as like a father figure mm. or I'm, they, I, I remind them of a time when they did have someone, an adult who was a dad who was there at a time in their life. And it's sort of, mm. yeah, that, that's a bit of a, yeah. a, a thing like, oh, I didn't really think about that in my line of work, but it's important, the role that I'm holding. So I'm actually being a role model of a dad in my work as well. Yeah. Not just the boys, this is to girls as well. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a real privilege to be in there. Well, that's awesome. And we all want dads out to see us, <laughs> right? We all love it when our dads, when we, we yeah. all want a dad, we all want our dads to see us. Um, so just sort of in, in winding up, um, I mean, there's dads that are listening to this that are living with their children, the children are in their home, and there's dads mm. that are listening who are separated, and, and they've got the, the greater challenge of seeing the children less often. Absolutely. Um, maybe there's one piece of advice for both, or, or maybe there's two separate pieces of advice just to sort of finish off in. But, um, and you might come back to just saying being present, but, you know, what is it? What's the one thing that you would say to dads, hey, you know, um, do this? What, what's your one piece of advice that you would leave dads with today? Oh, look, just, um, just know the importance of relationships, you know? It, 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 I mean, it's on, it's, on, it's on us. It's on, do we want a relationship with our children? We either do or we don't. So are you going to make the time to make that happen? Are you going to, you know, are you going to, you going to finish work and then come home and be present instead of going out with the boys to the pub, that sort of thing? Are you going to go watch the footy on the weekend or are you going to take your child with you or are you going to go kick the ball around? So you work on your relationships is because especially at this young age because when they see you in that light, you're the role model. They aspire to be just like their dads. So mm -hmm. just, just, just put your relationship at the forefront with your children. And wherever you are, whatever capacity you have, not every father is with their partner or their children. It's really hard out there, and I acknowledge that. Some really hard times out there for dads, you know, in general. But the opportunities that you can have, build your relationship. And that could be reflecting back on yourself to better yourself while you're not seeing your children. Work on things. Work on your communication. Work on tuning into your child. What does your child actually like that you heard about last time from mum? Well, let's go and do that. You know, they want to go check this out. Let's go to, you know, let's just go read a book in the park and it's just things like that. Um, yeah. Wow. That's awesome, <laughs> man. I mean, that what a challenge, eh? Like if you're a separated dad, you might be thinking, well, I've got to take him out to the movies and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. But maybe taking a book to a park is probably the most powerful yeah. thing you could do. and it really is. Yeah. It's just mind-blowing. Things that you don't, don't overthink yeah. it, but that's what I mean about tuning in. Just be attuned to your children, you know, whatever interests them. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. Let's do more of that. Um, and yeah. let's just be the role models, you know? Yeah. I love that, Tampi. Um, I love the fact that you're a dad who's um, clearly wanting to be present and engaged at home. Um, and this is a conversation about encouraging dads to um, to – think about their language, their words, to think about the, you know, the tone of their voice um, and yeah. um, to be present and just to realize just how powerful those, those first few years are 
Um, it's, and often for us dads, um, just thinking about it, it's a training ground, eh, for us too. Like those first thousand days, we're trying to work out what it's like to be a dad. Yeah, um, yeah scary. Yeah, it is. It's scary. It is really scary. This, um, and this is why messages in, in your podcast, Micah, are important. If we can just get the word out, you know, put put these messages out um, to be more aware of and, you know, myself, like I said, four kids and then I look back at the first three and I never knew things that I know now. And I just feel like I've got a new lease on life to try and better that, better myself, better relationships for my child's future, especially Hawaii, you know, at this young age, I feel like we're doing pretty well. Mm. Uh, and he reminds us of that and, and the teachings that we, we, we've we given to him because the parents are, are our kids' first teachers. So we, we just got to model everything to them. Yeah. That's awesome, Tampi. And mm. listen, I really appreciate your time. Um, if you're ever down this way, we'd love to have you come in yeah. and, and connect um, to our, our team down here. I uh, really appreciate it. I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, so thanks heaps. Um, Gone fast. Uh, and um, look forward to catching you next time, man. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. And uh, hi to all the dads out there. Appreciate the platform. And I'm looking forward to seeing more dads on here to talk about things that uh, we don't often talk about. Cool. Awesome. Cool, man. Cheers, Thank Mike. You. Have a good day.